All right, we're up. Hey, Rick. Hey, Sharon. How's it going? Good, dear. Um, let's let's uh, talk today about the um, you know, when buyers we we're always telling them about the down payment. We also know uh, that there are closing costs, percentage, what's included, what they should save money for to make sure the house closes beyond the down payment. Sure. Uh, well. Closing costs are uh, are going to differ depending on whether you're a first time buyer, where you're buying. Yeah. For example, in Toronto, uh, they have an additional land transfer tax, uh, so yes. you get paid twice. Yeah. Uh, however, as far as lenders are concerned, they just want to see one and a half percent of the purchase price of the property in your bank account, so that they know that the deal is not going to fall through because you can't pay your lawyer, you can't. Uh, you know, uh, pay the land transfer tax, whatever it is, they require in addition to your down payment that you have one and a half percent of the purchase price for closing costs. So minimum down payment is 5% uh, if you're doing a under $500,000 transaction. Uh, however, you will need an additional one and a half percent. So you really need six and a half percent minimum to buy a property. Mm -hmm. uh, now that actually increases once you get over uh, five hundred thousand. The closing cost remains the same percentage, but the right. closing cost uh, goes up to uh, ten percent for any amount over five hundred thousand. So, for example, if it's a six hundred thousand dollar purchase, you need twenty five thousand for the first five hundred thousand, and then ten thousand for each hundred thousand thereafter. So, six hundred thousand would be a thirty five thousand down payment. And then you would need another nine thousand for closing costs, right? Because one and a half percent is six hundred thousand. Yeah. So grand total forty four thousand for a six hundred thousand dollar property. Now, there's no guarantee that it's going to one and a half percent will cover all your closing costs, or that uh, it will cost that much. You just have to have the funds in your bank account for the lender to be willing to proceed. Uh, now, with the two transfer taxes, does that cover the one and a half percent even cover that? Well, in Toronto I mean, proper. So uh, again, it depends on if you're a first time home buyer, uh, often the land transfer tax will be uh, pretty much waived, uh, depending again on you know how much the transaction is. Um, not sure off the top of my head how much they are uh, are uh, what, what the maximum amount is for the land transfer tax so the yeah. first home buyer uh, yeah. can get rebated, but it's done yeah. at the lawyer's office. So essentially you don't even really need the money because it'll just be like rebated uh, as soon as it goes out. Um, but uh, the lender wants to see it in your bank account regardless. Um, you know, you, you've got uh, your legal fees uh, and uh, you know, various uh, costs that the lawyer can incur uh, to do the closing. Yeah. Uh, that, that's all part of your closing costs. So you've got to uh, be prepared for that. Uh, not to mention, you know, you're going to need to move your stuff in there. So you're probably going to want to hire a moving company or at the very least rent a truck, uh, things along those lines. So, uh, yeah, that's just uh, a little thing to be aware of because if you buy the house, and you haven't done your due diligence already to uh, make sure that you're pre-approved for a mortgage and no one has looked at your down payment and your closing costs to make sure that you know they're in a canadian financial institution and you can explain the source of all the funds uh and if any of those funds are gifted that you like they're gifted from someone that's eligible to gift it to you um like lenders won't usually accept a gift from a close friend it usually needs to be from a parent or a uh brother or sister or if you're uh if you have adult children then one of the children they need to be an immediate relation usually um yeah. so uh yeah th this is all important stuff like i've run into situations where the client is uh you know already agreed to purchase the property uh there's no waiver on finance uh, it's a firm close and uh, they want to get a mortgage but all their money is still overseas so right. it, yeah. uh, the lenders have to worry about anti-money laundering legislation. They have to be able to show if the regulator comes in and uh, audits them that they've done their due diligence to ensure 
that those funds are not from drugs or, you know, uh, right. Not someone trying to launder money. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Good point. It, they, they usually require at least three months of the funds sitting in a Canadian financial institution. And, you know, you have to be able to explain. So you want to avoid having a bunch of e-transfers into your account because that means they're yeah. going to want to the account they got e-transferred from if they're from your own account. Yeah. Um, or if they're not from your account, then you better have gift letters and they better be from someone that's eligible to gift the funds uh, and so forth. So this is why it's important to, uh, you know, get all your ducks in a row before you go in and you make an offer. It's probably one of the biggest reasons that uh, real estate deals fall apart is the financing. Uh, and if you have a firm offer on the table, you could end up uh, losing your deposit and potentially be sued for the difference in what the seller is able to get for the property if they can't find another buyer willing to pay the same price as you paid. So right. very yeah. important to, uh, th this is why it's so important to, you know, get a pre-approval done uh and uh get a real pre-approval not one of those things where it's like you go onto the bank's website and yeah. five minutes later they tell you you can qualify for this much because often you actually don't qualify for that much because if part of your income that you're including is not like your base salary if you're getting uh funds some of your income from bonuses uh if some of it's from commission uh overtime things like that it may not qualify as qualified income uh so and the uh the bank's website is probably not going to let you know about the one and a half percent closing costs you're going to go into the bank and say okay i need mortgage now and they're going to say great show me your sources of income and so forth and if it doesn't match uh as qualified income what you put in then maybe you're not approved for what you thought you were yeah so. yeah i i know that uh i will always you know um tell uh advise clients to start the process early like i get them to engage with a lawyer at the time when we're purchasing don't wait until you're closing and then i encourage them to follow up two weeks before closing and a week before closing um and i tell them discuss with your lawyer just call them speak with them say listen you've got my purchase agreements in front of you what else can you tell me that i you're going to need from me when i come to meet with you or on the day off I tell them to ask that question because I don't want anything to be overlooked. Yes, there's like um, the land transfer tax is big if they don't know about it. Um, but some it's just simple things like, you know, the closing costs. Like I've, I've had some run into issues with utilities because they didn't realize they needed deposits and, and, and have the utilities transferred. Now, I know I used to do it and uh, my lawyer would do all of that for me and it was just all there and was all included in the bill. But um, Today, a lot of that is done by the buyers themselves, so they need to make sure that's done and they need those kind of closing costs, right? But moving trucks, um, underestimating the cost of a moving vehicle, you know, yeah. and what's involved. And no one can give you, like, that stuff you've got to do the homework on because every location is different, the volume, the size, the amount of stuff you're moving, and the kilometers, <laughs> right? And, and, and do you the on the movers too, because there's a lot of moving scams out there right now. Exactly, exactly. So taking the time to do the work for that is a, is another big one. And and again, can't be done in a, like just, oh, I'll do it whenever, and it's a couple hundred dollars, you'd be surprised, oh. you know? <laughs> I, I can't imagine you would get more than a truck rental for a few hundred dollars now no and and then there's a case of like you know like the, the, there'll be things where you know uh they didn't get the keys till late so mm -hmm. uh then the moving uh truck can't now deliver today because by the time you get the keys but your truck is loaded so now you're paying overnight storage fees and mm -hmm. sometimes offloading and reloading so like there yeah, is that extra is. cash that you need yeah. right to to make sure like you don't want to get this far and then screw up on your purchase just because, 100%. right? It's and it's so most of this is so easily avoided, right? You just uh, you know need to uh, engage with your realtor and uh, your mortgage agent uh, in advance, and uh, we'll go through yeah. all this stuff because we don't want to uh, have the deal fall apart after doing all the work. So we're we're gonna you know do the due diligence in advance, make sure that you know what the is on your job letter is going to be acceptable uh, yeah. you know, because 
you know, if you're not guaranteed 40 hours a week or full-time hours, uh, you know, that could be a problem. Even if you have, you know, tend to work 40 hours a week, or maybe you average out to 40 hours a week, most lenders aren't going to accept that as full-time income. We're going to yeah. probably end up doing a two-year average of your income. And what if you haven't worked there for two years, right? So uh, th these are all things that uh, you need to be aware of. Uh, and a lot of people get caught out on because yeah. they just go to the bank's website and they're like, yes, this is how much I make per year. And it's like, well, that's great. But, you know, doesn't it has to be qualified income. And also that's, I mean, and it's good to get all of that done early because let's say you need to bring another person in on the part, on the, on the transaction. Maybe mm -hmm. one of your older kids are working and they can help with a difference in the purchase price. Or maybe it's one of your parents, um, you know, coming in on the transaction. So if you've got a co-signer or another buyer on the property. Um, and, and not to mention like what houses are you missing out on because you're looking at houses that you can't qualify for, right? Yeah. Would you mind touching on that, um, like in terms of the buying process, also about the cosigner? Um, okay, so uh, once again, uh, so it depends. Like, uh, usually they don't allow cosigners per se. Uh, they, they will like make limited exceptions. Like, if you're almost there, you just uh, need a little bit of help. Uh, yeah. But usually they want the other person to actually be on title and on the mortgage as well. So yeah. they're actually a co buyer. Yes. Now, it, you can structure uh, ownership in a couple of different ways. Uh, so you can have it so that you're joint owners uh, in common. Uh, yeah. Sorry, joint, joint tenants in common uh, tenants is the term. Yeah. Or yeah. you can uh, also uh, be joint tenants. Uh, you can have rights of survivorships. Or I'm trying to think of the other one. It's escaping me right now. Um, but anyways, basically in one structure... The way the ownership works is if uh, someone dies or like then the ownership will transfer to their estate. Yes. You don't have to have 50-50 ownership. Uh, yeah, and right of survivorship. You, yes. So yeah. if you don't have the right of survivorship uh, and it's owned, uh, you know, whereas you have different percentages of the property, uh, you can structure it that way. And then you would have like, for example, you, whoever your co-signer is, it's a parent or whatever they can be on title for say 1% yeah. and you're on yeah. for the remaining 99%. That's often how yeah. people do it. Um, but you should be aware when you're looking for a cosigner, just because they make good money and have good credit doesn't necessarily mean they'll be a good cosigner or a good per person to also go on title with you. Uh, a cosigner is not actually on title. That's the distinguishing uh, in this case. But it's hard to have just a cosigner. So yeah, you, yeah. Lenders, well, so everyone on title is jointly and severally responsible for the mortgage. Yes. So the lender doesn't want to let the co-signer off the hook. I mean, they're still responsible, but they want them like right in the mortgage. Like it, I guess yeah. it's the protection for the lender to have yeah. them there. Um, so anyways, uh, just because someone is uh, good income and good credit, uh, they might not be a good co-signer because if they have too much debt themselves or not necessarily the amount of debt, it's more the cash flow situation, how much they're spending on their debt every month. So if they've got high, high car payments and high mortgage payments, they yeah. might not have a lot of room to help you. They might actually make it worse than rather yeah. than that. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we have to take a look at those situations and yeah. uh, see if they would be able to actually help out uh, in that situation. But yes, that is a route we can go. If you have someone that's willing to uh, take on that extra responsibility uh, and help you out, then uh, that can definitely make a difference. Now, something I want to mention on that, and I know it kind of deviates a little from closing costs, but it all ties in because at the end of the day, we want you to be able to close your property in a way that you can do it. Um, and and so they can do the mortgage for a little while and then upon renewal have the name taken off title? Certainly. Well, I mean... It you would probably want to wait for renewal because, of course, you're going to pay break fees. Uh, right. Sorry, payment penalties is technically yeah, yeah. if you were to uh, break the mortgage early. Yeah. Uh, but you could, if it was important, you could break it before renewal uh, and yeah. pay those fees. Uh, yeah. For example, if the other person uh, wants to buy their own property and being on your mortgage is going to prevent them from doing that, 
because that's going to factor into their total debt service ratio when they're trying to qualify for a new yeah. mortgage. Uh, so, but yes, a time of renewal is an ideal time to do it. Um, now you will have to requalify on your own and the qualifications can change. So yeah. you could end up in a position where you, you cannot uh, take them off the mortgage uh, and still get a mortgage, right? Right, right. But, yeah, but, so these are all things they'd yeah. have to think about regardless, right? Mm -hmm. And you also might want to be careful as to who you put on your mortgage uh, because, you know, they can be very unreasonable if you want to sell. Uh, we've run into that situation before uh, with, uh, yes. with clients. So you, you want to, uh, you know, have an agreement in place uh, as to how this is all going to wrap up. Uh, especially if it's more than just like a 1% share that they're going on for. Like if they're yeah. putting any money into yeah. it or uh, anything like that, these are things you want to figure out in advance because, you know, the people can have a very different understanding of what the agreement is if it's not in writing. So and, Right. So kind of, kind of, this is where I'm kind of going with, with this too, is that we have, so has in terms of mortgage brokerage now, uh, you, we've got them working with their down payment, but we're all can also be very creative on what closing on what term they need. So if I really only needed someone to cover me for six months and we knew that in six months I could surely do this, then we'd probably be taking a very short term or a one year mortgage, for example. 100%. The terms that you uh, can choose uh, are different. You can also take a variable mortgage or uh, right the, so we uh, don't have to tie up some our parents yeah. for example or sibling yeah. for the next five years or 25 years we can do this for six months we can do it for a year yeah. and it can make all the difference so again yeah, I, one of the packages that you offer in terms of what types of financing options are available that may or may not be with a bank yeah well an adjustable rate mortgage uh usually you're just looking at uh one and a half months of uh, what your mortgage payment is. It's second, It's three months of the interest portion of the payment. Right. So if it's a 25 year amortization, then generally speaking, you're looking at about 50% uh, of three months payments because about yeah. half of it is interest. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's compared to like, if you've got a fixed term, uh, that, that can be a much higher break fee, sorry, three payment penalty. Uh, if you but if we're going the short terms and we don't have to worry about breaking yeah right? well yes you, you can just uh but you can have the best of both worlds because if you want because if you get mm. a good adjustable rate mortgage like a discounted like a rate that's discounted off prime by say one percent or something like that uh yeah. you can have the flexibility of keeping it for five years or you can you know break it at any point and uh, just pay the uh True, the true. Penalty, and it's not a big penalty. Uh, so, yeah. yes, you, you also lose the security of knowing that your payment, at least uh, for the whatever term you select, is not going to be locked in. You could end right, up having right. higher payments if interest rates go up. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, it was nice knowing what the options are. And um, um, people know what flexibility they actually have. Right. So, uh, again, it's making it easier to tie it up and uh, um, then they can just kind of do that little bit of maintenance after the effect for something they can't quite get done before, but they want to get in on the market. For sure. Thank you but, for that, Rick. Yeah. Uh, I, I just want to put in a caveat that uh, you, you do have to watch what happens with uh, qualifying rules can change and, uh, you know, interest rates can go up. So, you know, you have to be prepared for the eventuality that you won't be able to get them off the mortgage if things change, right? So they, the person co-signing does need to, or sorry, the person that is going in with you uh, needs to be aware of that risk. Obviously being aware of all the risk yes. matters big time. Um, and we all always know what our federal government's going to do, right? They're easy to predict. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Just like we said, interest rates are going nowhere right before they raise them like a record amount. Right? Then, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But again, yeah. So walking through with some wisdom, um, there's options. We just got to weigh them all. Awesome. Thank you, Rick. Thanks, Sean. Take care. You too.
Uh, let's see. Do we want to stop the recording or uh, and then start a new one? Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Oh, I think I'm in the wrong thing. That's why. Can I click on that? No. Here it is.